All right. Welcome, everybody. So just the, the discussion for today is just um, a matter of God's plans and our plans and um, finding the balance and the discernment of when we're the ones responsible for acting and when God is the one responsible for acting. Um, the thought that kind of entered my head thinking about this stuff is that um, people have a kind of automatic tendency where they like to they like to control circumstances and other people first before opting to control themselves. And the only thing that we really have control of is ourselves. But it's so easy to want to rather want to manipulate circumstances to be easier for you or to have people behave in ways that are more amenable to you to relieve your problems rather than having to deal with your own emotions, dealing with you know, building that proper response mechanism to problems that can come around in your life. Um, and this also got me thinking about how, you know, repentance is such a key thing to Christianity, a foundational kind of like, without it, it doesn't exist. And it's beautiful because all repentance really is, is changing your mind, right? And if you think about it too, any part of your life that you want to be different it can't be different unless you first start changing your thinking about that thing, right? And so in regards to thinking and plans and what are we responsible for, what is God responsible for in life? Um, it's, you know, it's, it's something where our thinking will play a big part, but let me read this verse. And this is kind of the one I, I, I would like for us to all, you know, percolate on a little bit while we're going through these other verses. It says, Proverbs 69, the mind of a person plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So it's kind of, there's this, this dance of the relationship with man and God, right? Where we'll make our plans and then God is going to have his influence on the matter and figuring out the balance of those two things is a really helpful thing for us to be able to be successful in our mission as Christians. So the next one I wanted to share is Proverbs 21, five. It says the plans of the diligent certainly lead to advantage, but everyone who is in a hurry certainly comes to poverty. So being diligent and having plans is a, a good thing. Um, Isaiah 32, eight says, but the noble person devises noble plans and by noble plans, he stands. So it kind of implies that if we want to be noble, we should be devising plans that are noble. Um, prepare plans by consultation and make war by wise guidance. So basically the idea that I'm um, getting to is that we're going to find ourselves in circumstances on a routine basis where we can make plans, but we can't control the outcome. And when that is the case, at least from my experience, when you don't get the sense that you can control the outcome, then it becomes the path of least resistance becomes to not make a plan and just to see what happens. Because if you don't feel like you have control over the situation, it's easier to just take down, take on the victim role and just see what happens. And then, you know, you have an excuse for things not working out. But the tricky thing is that there are times as well in scripture where God will say, I'm going to do this. You need to do nothing. So finding the balance between when do we sit back and let God do his thing? And when do we invest our time and our, and our mental energy into putting together plans or strategies or, or whatever for our lives to bring about what it is that we think we're supposed to do in the world as, as God's servants. So I just wanted to read a couple quick examples here and then we can break off and start talking about it. But um, I think these kind of, these two passages will give an example of where God does the acting and the people don't need to do anything. 
But at the same time, the reason that it worked out that way is because the people did what they were supposed to do prior. So Exodus chapter 14, 13 and 14, this is kind of the conclusion when, you know, they're about to walk through the Red Sea and, and all that sort of stuff. They've been, you know, they've left Egypt and now they're being chased and all that sort of stuff. So, but Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he'll perform for you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, you will never see them again, ever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. So it's interesting, you know, to think that there will come times in our lives where we can just sit back and watch all these happenstances come to place at one point and everything works out in our favor. And I'm sure we probably all each individually have stories of that happening. And it's something that we couldn't have possibly planned out on our own, you know, thinking because it's things we don't have control over. Um, but what they did have control over and what we have control over is how we live leading up to these, these moments in time where things happen this way. And what they did do is they did obey what had Moses had told them and, and what God had told them with regards to leaving Egypt at the right time and, you know, doing all the things that they were doing, just carrying on as all the plagues were going on in Egypt and kind of proving God's power to the Pharaoh. Right. Um, so there was several layers and continuances of obedience and living in accordance with the plan that God had laid out that led up to this. Right. Now, the last thing I'm going to read is a bit of a bigger passage, but I think it'll be worth it. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I'm just going to read the first 25 verses. And this is uh, a battle with King Jehoshaphat. It says, now it came about after this, that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with, the, with some of the Meunites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Aram, and behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. Jehoshaphat was afraid. So this is important, right? Jehoshaphat was, in, was afraid and turned his attention to seek Yahweh. He proclaimed a period of fasting throughout Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek from the Lord, and they all came they, and they even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. So this is a really important lesson here, just in verse three, right? So he was afraid, but then what did he do? He didn't try to, you know, make some sort of rash command or, you know, urgently try and get some sort of, you know, idea of human knowledge that would solve the problem. Like, how can we rally up as many troops as possible, as quick as possible to try and overpower them? It, that wasn't what came to his mind first. It was, I'm afraid, so I'm gonna I'm gonna seek the Lord, and then he gets other people to fast, so show more spiritual devotion towards seeking the Lord. Right. Verse five. So then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord in front of the new courtyard, and he said, "Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hands, so that no one can stand against you." Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land from your people Israel and give it to the descendants of your friend Abraham forever? They have lived in it and, he, and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon you, the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. Now behold, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you did not allow Israel to invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, for they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given to us, given us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, with their wives, and their children. This is such a cool picture, right? <laughs> they're admitting that they're powerless to do anything and just saying, God, please help. Um, then in the midst of the assembly, the spirit of Yahweh came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph. 
And he said, listen, all you of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, this is what Yahweh says to you. Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You need not fight in this battle. Take your position, stand, and watch the salvation of the Lord on your, in your behalf, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be feared or dismayed. Tomorrow, go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord, the Levites and the sons of the Kohathites, and from the sons of the Korites, Korahites, stood up to praise Yahweh, God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Super cool, right? So they just admit their complete inability to do anything about this situation and place themselves completely at God's feet, reminding themselves and bringing up before God his promises and showing the injustice of the situation and that they need deliverance. And immediately he responds with direct instructions on how they are to behave and what they're supposed to do. So they act obediently given their circumstances by seeking God. And then after they do that, he gives them the answer with the directions for them to obey for this to all come about the right way. <clears throat> so they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and her inhabitants of Jerusalem, put your trust in the Lord, your God, and you will endure. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, give thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were struck down. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, completely destroying them. And when they had finished with the inhabit inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they turned toward the multitude, and behold, there were corpses lying on the ground. There was no survivor. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take the spoils, they found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things, which they took for themselves more than they could carry, and they were taking the spoils for three days because there was so much. So just using all these two examples, um, you know, it's a pretty inspiring story, but it's something that we can apply to our lives on a daily basis, really, because as I mentioned in the beginning, right, we really only have control of ourselves, right? So day-to-day -day problems happen, big or small, sometimes catastrophic, and when we find ourselves in a situation where the only thing we actually have control over is our own thoughts and attitudes, that's the time where we have to find that intersection between what is God going to do in this situation and what am I supposed to do in this situation that I can do in this situation. And um, then this kind of can expand out into other things like just general planning for your life, you know, um, and going back to the last thing I'll, I'll I'll remind and go to is um, talking about making making plans. You know, the noble man makes noble plans. Um, we don't want to be the type of people who wait for things to come by in life. We want to be the type of people that are seeking God to determine what He wants us to achieve, right? Um, and so, part of this is that we want to be finding ourselves in a situation where we have the type of connection with God that Jehoshaphat had and then fostered with his, within his entire community and the people that were, you know, that he was ruling over. Um, and so in any community that we're in, we should be trying to do the same where we're fostering this kind of, you know, complete reliance on connection to God to not only guide us, but provide for us when we're in situations where we can't provide for ourselves in the moment. So, um, I guess maybe there's there's one one other thing I'll say. So going back to the beginning, uh, inspired by my my friend Steve Courage on YouTube, um, 
he, he talks a lot about business in Africa and the thing he made a video, I think it was called like why Africa's poor or something like that. And um, he's in Nigeria and he's a, he's a legitimate business person, not a scammer. And um, he, he made the point that Africa has a lot of poverty because people will spend hours and hours and hours at church praying for God to do something for them, but they won't do something for themselves. And they won't go out and, and start something or take action on stuff. And, you know, I, I'm just taking his word for it because I haven't been to visit and kind of surveyed the culture myself, but he's pretty open about all the different cultural differences in Africa versus, you know, say the US. Um, and, it, and it just inspired me an interesting thought of like, yeah, well, sometimes we're the one who needs to take action. And then sometimes God is the one who needs to take action. And discovering that balance between what is our responsibility um, to get our butts off the couch and go do something or make a plan or make a decision about how we're going to change in our lives. And then versus when we find a situation where we have no control and we just have to rely on God. But yeah, go ahead, John, before we break things up. You're really making me think about Philippians 4. Um, you know, I, I tend to think of this section uh, from verse 4 down to verse 9 um, in terms of, you know, relieving anxiety, you know, in your life. But if I put it into the kind of thought process that, that you're sharing, it, it basically gives you both ends of that spectrum, right? So, so it begins with rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, all right? So that's something that we need to do, right? Yes. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Okay, well, that's something that we need to do, right? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So in other words, okay, now we need to turn it over to God, right? We need to go to God in prayer and we need to give things to him to handle these things that we're having, you know, anxiety and worry about things like that. Then in verse eight, it says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things, right? So, you know, there, it, I don't know that it's so much we're, we are doing something there, but it's <laughs> more of like how, how you're ordering your thoughts, you know, what are you focusing your thoughts on? And then finally, in verse nine, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And it's like that verse nine just encapsulates the entire, you know, thrust of, of what you're, you're sharing, right? That, that we need to practice the things of God and God will be with us, right? He's going to be fighting for us and helping us and, you know, that kind of good stuff. Yes. Amen. No, I'm glad you brought up that passage because you're right. Um, and it, it, it actually emphasizes even further a point that John, you know, I'm kind of a big fan of, and I like to talk about, but uh, this whole thinking thing and, and Dean, yeah, you just reminded me in the chat that we all, a bunch of, some of us watched War Room again last night in the, the Fellowship movie night, which is my first attendance actually. But um, that movie definitely reminded me of the importance of how life change starts with repentance, which means life change starts with changing your thinking, right? Um, because if you want a behavior in your life to stop, you have to stop thinking in the way that leads to that behavior, right? And so, you know, verse eight and nine, I, part of me almost thinks that just that, that passage alone, if it were like, if the, if the Bible was only 10 verses long and we had two, those two in it, it, it would be effective still. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, that's kind of the, the thoughts I had and that I, I hope we get some fruitful discussion about just figuring out where it is, where each of us maybe is holding back, um, taking action where we should and then also maybe where we are 
in ways trying to play God in our lives, trying to manipulate circumstances or influence people to be a little more of the way we'd like them to be rather than just saying, I can't do anything about this God, I need you, you know? So um, I'm gonna start splitting people up, but I guess I can stop recording now. And hey, if you're seeing this on YouTube, we'd love to have you join in on one of these uh, breakout session uh, study group type meetings too. So uh, here's your preview of what it's like. and. Um, yeah, we love you. Talk to you later.